just always envisioned this product that will allow me to get my time back, that would do my job for me while I can go and do something else. And maybe that something else is just sleeping an extra two hours or doing nothing because I was doing the exact same thing every day. Why can't it be a video? But the thing that's missing from a video is the ability to ask a question and then to be able to respond. So I've tried many, many things that are out there. Like if it's out there, I've tried it but nothing was really built to the level that I wanted it to. And not a single webinar, whether it's a live webinar solution or an automated solution, had an intercom style chat where I can hop in to respond in real time if I want to, or respond by email later. There was nothing on the market even today outside of us that actually has that. So I just dreamt of this for years. All right, welcome to today's Vital Podcast. Today we have a special guest, Melissa Kwan. Melissa is a three times bootstrapper. She's built and sold two major software companies and right now is bootstrapping eWebinar.com. It's an amazing webinar software and Melissa has a ton of great insights on running businesses of all types and in all stages. She's been through quite a few different varieties of business situations and she's got a ton of wisdom to share. Really a lot of great advice for other entrepreneurs out there in terms of how to focus, how to stop chasing shiny objects and really focus on the real leverage points that your business presents as opportunities. So really excited to share this conversation with you, whether you are a business owner or looking to start a business, I think you're going to find a lot of value and a lot of actionable takeaways here. So let's dive in. This podcast is brought to you by vidtow.com. Vidtow is our free YouTube ad library and spy tool research tool. It's V-I-D-T-A-O.com. At Vitao, we have close to a million unlisted YouTube video ads that you can search, find, discover how they're doing on a day-by-day basis. So you can really see what ads your competitors are running, see ads in different markets that you can model to create new winning ads for yourself, and a whole lot more. It's all there inside vidtao.com. Plus, we have a premium edition. So The database is free to access, but then we also have a premium edition where you have full unlimited access to the database. And inside there, we also provide training. So we also run an agency called Inceptly, that's I-N-C-E-P-T-L-Y, Inceptly.com, where we've managed over $150 million on YouTube. It's a video traffic agency, and we've worked with everyone from brands like Descript.com, Huel, to real scrappy direct response info products supplements health beauty e-commerce you name it we've done it and love sharing what we've learned every week we drop new training in there everything from youtube ad media buying to running e-commerce creatives on youtube to hardcore tracking and attribution tutorials to really level up your data science game for advertising and everything in between. Right now, as we speak, we're working on a training regarding YouTube Shorts. Um, Hopefully we'll be live by the time you hear this. On and on and on. This is our passion is video advertising and we wanna share it with you inside of Vidtal Premium. And actually right now, for a limited time, you can get access to Vidtal Premium for a very special price. So if you go to vidtal.com, sign up for free, check out the database, upgrade to premium for this very special price so you get access to all of the database and all the trainings and also wanted to add that at inceptly we do free brainstorm calls with clients like you so if you ever want to get help or ask questions about your youtube ads your video traffic on other platforms we're available to chat just go to inceptly.com slash call c-a-l-l and set up a time to chat it's free and we'd love to speak with you our team's waiting to speak with you so without further ado let's get into the show Melissa calling in from Amsterdam welcome thank you you so much for being on our show thanks so much for having me so okay so you are a three-time bootstrapped founder right so and for folks out there who don't know what bootstrapped is does that mean are you um, did you have a bunch of money in Silicon Valley Bank and <laughs> just curious, yeah. yeah, how does that compare to, you know, we think about like venture capital series, seed series, A, B, C, B, blah, 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 versus bootstrapped. Just, can you walk us through what's the difference there? 
Yeah. So we don't care. We don't care about any of the series A, B, C to, you know, F. <laughs> um, we are largely self-funded. We have some friends and family funding as well. Um, but I think bootstrapping just means you don't have any venture capital. Um, oftentimes it means, you know, the founders invest their own money. They have some friends and family money, maybe some, you know, family funds, um, like, um, or, you know, mostly it's like customer, customer funded companies. So that's kind of, uh, where we are. Um, we grow very differently than I guess a venture back company, a venture back company might care about, uh, you know, the next round. So they would care a lot about, you know, growth numbers, percentages, number of customers, um, revenue. Uh, what we care about is profit because we need to float ourselves. <laughs> and that forces you to think about very different things and not just pumping revenue numbers, but actually creating a product that delivers value that people stick around for and hopefully will pay more and more for over time. Yeah, and I'm just curious, you know, um, as a side note, you, you post some amazing content on LinkedIn. You're super consistent. And I love how you're, a lot of times I think like B2B, people in the more B2B space lean on, you know, we're focusing on the brand. It's, you're very personal. You share a lot of personal stories on LinkedIn, which I, I really appreciate. And I think um, I definitely advise other people to just learn, you can learn a ton. But I just saw one thing that you post recently about um, scaling too fast. You know, a lot of times, Companies can be so fixated on this scaling number, you know, this daily active users or whatever other metric you're trying to hit. And can you just walk us through a recent? It sounds like sounds like there was like a panic, which is it's probably a good a good panic <laughs> overall. But yeah, uh, where there you was have a someone who scaled too fast, too soon, and what happened? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I guess the backstory is, you know, everyone talks about scaling and hockey stick growth. And, you know, that's like the one thing that you should be striving for, right? And I, I, I recently had an experience that made me realize, you know, that we're not ready to scale um, because, you know, we've been around, like the product's been around for a little over two years. Um, there are, you know, a majority of customers who use the product, you know, I would say as we intend for it to be used. Um, and, you know, and that, Inevitably, you have some people that come through and because, you know, you sign up on your own. It's not an enterprise, like one-on-one -on -one, um, sign-up process. So anybody can sign out with a credit card, 14-day free trial. But inevitably, you do have people that come through that figure out certain loopholes and exploit using your product. So um, as some background, we have, for eWebinar, we have an unlimited usage model. So that means um, our pricing is based on the number of webinars you have active, but it does not depend on number of users, number of attendees, the number of times you play that webinar. And for the large part, that's okay. And in the past, you know, we've had some people that, you know, abuse our trials, right? Every two weeks they sign up for a new trial and then we can, we, you know, eventually we we catch them. But the instance that happened, um, you know, two, three weeks ago was somebody came through and they pumped in 100,000 attendees per week. So 400,000 or close to half a million in a month. And the problem with this is we pay for streaming time because we are a webinar automation software. Our webinars are based on a video. It's not based on live stream, like what you know as, you know, a Zoom webinar. So the more you play it, the more bandwidth we're consuming. And we pay Vimeo, you know, a, an annual budget so that they give us a significant enterprise discount. So you can imagine if one person comes in, even if they're on our highest plan, which is, you know, $299, they are burning the quota that we've allocated based on our last year's usage. So we've never had somebody like this, and nor could we have envisioned that this type of user can exist, right? You, you never think about that, right? But this person figured out that by using eWebinar, they don't have to use their own YouTube or their own Vimeo because we want to provide a better experience. So we actually do all this on our own platform. There are some solutions that, like, that make you put in your own Vimeo and you have to pay for that. But that's not the experience we want to provide. So this guy figured this out. And he was actually using something else that made him use his own account. But he came in and he was like, oh, I can actually just save my own cost by using this platform.
But not only that, he realized by using our platform, he was converting three times the sales as wow. he was with someone else. Wow. So then he was spending, like I asked him, this is the number he told me, and I'm not sure if this is real, but he told me that he was spending around $7,000 a day on ads. And this could be, you know, YouTube ads, you know, Facebook, TikTok, whatever it might be. But he wasn't paying me. He was paying me $300 a month. Flat. Meanwhile, yeah, yeah me, flat. Meanwhile, I'm burning all the streaming costs. And that's just the streaming costs. That's not the database costs and all the other costs that we have. But this forced us into a position where we had to figure out what is the true cost of, attend of an attendee. We never had to figure that out before. But it forced us to figure out, okay, what is the true cost of goods sold? We have to start putting limits on our plans. So where, where is the limit, right? Where is the limit relative to how much we're charging people today? And where do we start to break even? We never really had to figure that out before. The other problem was not just, hey, you're consuming all our money, but because he was pumping in so many people, it caused the system to spike at certain times. And then at those times, the service for all of our customers on the platform would degrade. So for example, some chat messages weren't going through for an hour, or some people couldn't join and then they would bounce. But then it forced us also in a position where we had to figure out how do we effectively scale our platform so that when there are more people, our database scales as well. So these are just not things that we've we've thought about in the past. Um, so that was the good part of somebody like that coming in. The bad part of someone like that is you don't have a way to charge them right now. Like not only do you have not have a way to limit them, you don't have a way to charge them. I didn't even know how much he was burning. Eventually we figured it out. We reached out to him and, and we actually do have a fair use policy in our terms that says that we can kick you off the platform if we believe that you are, you know, exploiting the use of the platform. And actually he was like pretty nice. We had a couple conversations. He wanted to work this out with us. And at some point I was like, okay, we actually figured out you were burning just in the last month. You had spent $5,000 of our own money wow. in, in the Vimeo quota. And we asked him to cover it just for now, just the base cost. And that's just on Vimeo so that we can figure out what, a, what an appropriate business model would be moving forward. Um, of course, he's like, well, I'm not going to do that. And so we basically just removed him within two hours um, and haven't heard from him since. <laughs> and so that right. that was the incident that I had posted about. But the, the story is a lot of people think, I have customers, I'm ready to scale. Having customers and having happy customers does not mean you're ready to scale. Ready to scale really means if you have, you know, 10 times the, the traffic come in today, next week, are you prepared for it? Not just from a tech technology perspective, but also from a support and just kind of human capital perspective. So it really forced us to think about things that we didn't have to before. Wow, that's that's really interesting. And so just backtracking on one point, so he's spending seven thousand dollars a day on ads. Your webinar, your on eWebinar, your software, which I'll mention in the intro, but um, you know he's converting three times. 3x what he's converting on his old system. So he's basically making yeah. more making more money every day. And yeah. then that's a really interesting he, but he step but here but this is what I don't understand is okay. he's spending, you know, let's say five to ten thousand. He told me yeah. seven thousand is probably more, right? Yeah. You're spending five to ten thousand dollars on ads and making money like three times in your conversion, but you still won't pay me to cover my costs, right? So these right. are actually things that I don't fully understand about, you know, marketers that are out there. Like maybe he's gone to find another platform that he can exploit or maybe he's like piecing things together himself. Um, but that was actually like, it it, it was it was an eye-opening moment because at the very least, because we had a couple conversations with him like on the phone, um, at the very least, we thought he would just cover our costs because like if he went to Vimeo himself, he's not going to be able to get the the price that that we do. But like, I was actually shocked that the answer was like, no, we're not going to cover your cost. Yeah, because that backs out to like $170 a day. <laughs> well, yeah, and he told me <laughs> like, he's making about like 10K a day. So yeah, yeah that, that math doesn't actually make sense to me, but 
you know, it, it's like part of the fun of like having a startup is you have these stories to tell. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because I think, you know, with cloud stuff or just software in general, we always assume that cost of goods sold is zero, right? Or that's like this sort of <laughs> yeah. back of the napkin math. But then you see like, you know, I, I, you know, on a, I can just name chat GPT pro as an example where you have like, no, you have, you know, what was it? It was like 40, 40, um, queries to GPT for last week. And then now it's like 20 every three hours. So there's clearly some unit economics happening that, you know, that, that we need to be cognizant of. So that's really interesting. I mean, did you, um, if you had to go back in time, would you, would there have been stress tests that you would have done on the system to try and preempt this? Or do you think like, you know what, this kind of stuff, you can't really predict it. And it's best to just do what you've done. Like you did now, just treat it in the, in the moment and then move on. Just curious about how you think about things looking back. Yeah. I mean, we've had smaller cases of this. Like the first time a spike happened was probably a month after the product launched. And we had the first company um, put in, you know, pump in like 3,000 registrants. And the attendance rate is usually at any given point, 30 to 60% of the registrants. So for the first time, we had 2,000 people on the platform at the same time. And same thing happened, right? The chats were slower, people couldn't join, people complained, you know, things like that. So we never had another issue after that because our platform was also like it it also grows, you know, predictably, right? Like we're we're not we're not funded. So we can't we don't have a bunch of money to throw at ads, right? So we have a predictable number of people that come through and we grow you know, in a steady and slow pace every month. So I would say that our customers right now are our best um, testers and stress testers. Because like anytime we push out a new feature, something breaks, we hear it in the next five minutes. And that's a really fortunate position to be in because you can really only test so much on only so many platforms. Um, You know, people use all sorts of devices and all sorts of browsers. Um, But I would say someone like this we would have just never imagined, right? Because he was driving the traffic of a hundred different users at the same time. And then all his, because all his webinars were on demand, our platform was then always busy because he was always pushing ads out there. So I don't think this is someone that we would have anticipated, but because he was here, we were able to see certain holes in our system and we were able to fix that right away. Um, but I mean, I, I guess the next step of this is if five of these people came in at the same time, you know, what would we do? But there, I think things, different things break at different times in your journey. Um, and you can only be so prepared for it. Uh, yeah. And I'm just curious too, you know, okay, now you, now you have sort of an idea of how you could price a a user like this in the future. And I know that, you know, just the fact that conversion rates were so much higher for this guy. Um, I imagine people who are listening to this right now, I mean, like 10K a day is, you know, it's a solid spend. I mean, we've seen webinars spending like close to 100K a day, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> and like, I can only imagine the uh, back end stress happening uh, in those situations. But I'm just curious, you know, would, would this be a new sort of additional pivot for eWebinar is like having these sort of high volume on demand sales webinars? Um, I know that traditionally it's the marketers that use webinar automation. Um, it's never been like a major focus of ours just because I'm not a marketer. I don't really know that industry. Like I'm from startups and I envisioned eWebinar because I was doing a lot of training and onboarding in my previous startup. So this is like the the whole like being able to deliver training and onboarding on repeat is just a problem that I personally lived and something that I can speak to very well. Um, of course, a lot of salespeople come through as well that use it for, you know, demos and stuff like that. We do, we have a ton of consultants, course creators, internet cash marketers that use this already to, you know, sell their courses and, and products. But that kind of volume is special, right? We have people that are, you know, that are, you know, leaders in their field and they do, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 registrants a month, but half a million is 
is just a different breed, I think. So um, I don't think we're 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 not really going to focus on on I guess that upper echelon, right? Because we we always want to be we want to have a solution that serves the masses because ultimately we need more revenue and more revenue comes from more customers. It doesn't come from more usage from a single customer. Like that's just not our business. Got it. Makes sense. Um, it's a really interesting, you know, your your journey getting here to eWebinar is really interesting too, at least what I'm aware of. Um, and just like you mentioned, how this product emerged from a genuine need that you saw in your your previous, uh, your one of your pre previous companies. I'm just curious if you could walk everyone through how you got here, you know, how you got, you know, from before startup one, this is your third bootstrap startup, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Uh, this, that's a really, really interesting journey. Love to hear how things have developed. Yeah. So my first two companies took up 10 years of my life. Um, they were both in real estate tech. My previous company was a SaaS company, like an enterprise SaaS solution for real estate companies. So um, we were an open house check-in iPad for real estate agents. And we sold to brokerages and, and franchises, and they would give it to their agents as like a perk, right, for joining the company. So um, part of the business, I mean, a large part of the business, after you sell the product, because that's like day one of the rest of your life with your customer, is making sure that the agents actually use your product, right? Otherwise, the companies are not going to renew. I mean, it's all month to month or, or annual. Right. So um, at every renewal, they'll see, okay, well, we only have 10% of our agents that are active. This is not valuable for us. And we're just going to cancel. Right. So I was the person that was doing all the training and onboarding webinars for every single customer that would sign on. And, you know, signing the deal is always fun, but now you got to service them and make sure that they're here. And we have, like, I was everything except for code. So everyone except for me is a developer because we were bootstrap. So you can imagine how many of these I was doing. But the problem was they were exactly the same. And it didn't matter how many I did, they were just never enough. Sometimes I would do seven or eight, like just the first onboarding webinar. And then, you know, I remember once there was like an, an 8,000 agent company that signed up and less than 20 people showed up. Because also these are, these are, you know, consultants, right? So in the day, they're doing their showings and open houses and meeting their clients. They're not sitting in front of a computer. So I think that problem was just more prevalent because of the industry that I was in. But over the years, I also realized that my other tech and vendor buddies lived with the, the same problem. So either they had a massive support team that would do these around the clock and it would still be never enough, or they would be like me that try to find like makeshift solutions, right? You put it on YouTube and then you put it on intercom and you try to get people to follow it, but then they don't actually go because they're not in front of you. Especially for, I think, trainings and demos and onboarding, people enjoy webinars because there's, there's, there's something about being able to engage with the host on the other side and ask questions that people really like. So I just always envision this product that will allow me to get my time back, that would do my job for me well, I can go and do something else. And, and maybe that something else is just sleeping an extra two hours or, or doing For nothing. Sure. Yeah, because I was doing the exact same thing every day. Why can't it be a video? But the thing that's missing from a video is the, is the ability to ask a question and then to be able to respond. So I've tried many, many things that are out there. Like if it's out there, I've tried it. But nothing was really built... Um, to the level that I wanted it to, and not a single webinar, whether it's a live webinar solution or a, an automated solution, had an intercom style chat where I can hop in to respond in real time if I want to, or respond by email later. There was nothing on the market, even today, outside of us that actually has that. So I just dreamt of this for years. And after that company was acquired, I had a bunch of different ideas that I wanted to do. Um, and this was the one that kept coming back to me because I just couldn't understand why billion dollar companies are out there solving live webinars and live broadcasts. Because at that time, it wasn't just Zoom that was out anymore, right? It was like Instagram, Facebook was doing live. There's Restream, like all these live event platforms, live conference platforms, but nobody was solving the scalability of that live content. 
Why do we do that? Because we know it's valuable, because we know people like it. But we can only do it once in a while, once a week, once every quarter. Right. So that was kind of how I arrived at like, this is the one that I'm going to do. Because I once like I remember one day I asked myself, how would I feel if someone else did this? After having thought about it every day for five years, right, right, like if something was out there, how would I feel? And that was when I immediately went to register the company, think about a name, and like start the design process. Uh, that's so cool. And just like just as you walk through this whole process, I mean, because I'm coming from the marketing space, I'm just thinking, wow, it's no surprise that this guy I hate to take it back to this, you know, uh, <laughs> hundred. Uh, half a million uh, sign up, sign ups a month guy that temporarily obstructed e webinar but um if you're able to do on demand webinars but you have the live chat element incorporated mm -hmm. there's no it's no surprise that this converted so much better right because you're getting people are asking questions they're getting live answers i mean that's that's unbelievable so um yeah and anyways super cool story i'm actually curious or do you see, you know, given like, for instance, GPT, let's say like AI, and then obviously things like, you know, uh, doing things with embeddings where you have like commonly FAQs and things that people have asked and be able to actually pull from that and then deliver custom tailored answers with your actual data to what people are asking real time. I'm just curious, where do you see this sort of chat interface element of eWebinar going in the future? Yeah, I mean, that, I think that's a pretty easy answer. Um, we have our own chat system right now, and it's not a chat bot, right? We've got a welcome message that greets you when you come in. It's it's literally just like any chat bubble on a website. It like you come here, it says, "Hey, Ian, how's your day? Thanks for joining me. If you have any questions, I'm here." If you type in a message and I'm not there in two or three minutes, you'll get an auto responder. But if I am here, I can't hop in. It's it's a simple system that people understand. There are so many different chatbots that are out there that are not, you know, predictive and 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 all that stuff, right? There's maybe knowledge bases that are put in. It tries to get you to choose your own adventure before it routes you to a person. The future of eWebinar is understanding that that's not what we do, right? Like if we are good at building chat, we would be a chat company. And I think this is where a lot of companies spread themselves too thin, right? They're like, oh, that's cool. Let's do that. But what is the core of your business, right? The core of our business is we deliver the most amazing webinar automation, which is also video consumption experience on the market. But we are not chat. So what we do in the future, which is actually coming up very soon, is we allow people to disable our chat and integrate any chat bot that they want to use. Because there's not, because I'm not in the chat business, there's not a single chatbot I can build that can fit all of our customers. But then I'm getting myself into this rabbit hole of building a completely new company while being bootstrapped. So I think there's going to be a whole lot of really interesting chat solutions that come out. And it's going to allow every company to personalize it in their own way. Like I personally would love to be able to feed chat GPT, all of my help articles, all of my blogs, all my customer questions, and have them be my support. Like, I would love to see that happen. So in the future, if someone did that, and I can actually just integrate that into an e-webinar experience, we would want to let people do that. Because we, 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 like, we very much believe in allowing people do or companies do what they're best at, so we can do what we're best at. Wow. So, I mean, this hits at this pitfall that, you know, I'm, I'm definitely guilty of. I know a lot of other people are, which is this shiny object um, excitement syndrome. How are you able to sort of stop that in its tracks? And then how are you able to also, I guess, identify really what this core competency is and what, you know, what that one, that one single mission to focus on? I'm just curious about how you deal with that. Yeah, so I think I mean I've I've definitely fallen into that trap, right? Of I think it's even easier for bootstrappers because if someone can come to you and say, if you had this, I'm gonna buy it. Right. And then you're like, oh, I need to build it now. 
that's how my first company turned from a product company to an agency. Because we said yes to everything because we needed the money. And then before you knew it, we were a custom apps company. But we started as a product and then nobody actually wanted the product. And we weren't adamant enough about selling just our product. And then we had all these custom features. And then people needed wanted to pick and choose and they wanted to be different than the other guy, right? So I didn't even realize I became an agency until somebody told me, if you build different apps for different people, you're an agency. And that was like four years in. So because I had that experience, I'm now very cautious to say no to things, right? Being true to who you really are. Because anytime you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else that's a priority for you. And if we are an, a webinar automation company, we have to figure out, okay, well, what makes a webinar automation company, right? It's the ability to, um, you know, engage people with a video, uh, entice them to stay till the end so the offer can be presented. We want them to be able to ask questions during, um, you know, during the video session, during the webinar session. We want to be able to have different interactions that you can program. So like polls, questions, quizzes, that makes the webinar experience more full. We want to be able to have follow-ups and reminders and calendar invites, but not to the extent of a CRM. That is such a dangerous path to go through because... CRMs have been around for 20, 30 years now, right? And you don't want to, you don't want to compete in a product category that's really mature, right? I would say that automated webinars are not that mature, right? We're kind of still bleeding edge. Not everyone knows about them. People still kind of know like the Zooms of the world um, or they know like YouTube. They don't really know that there's a world between them. And every single day we have people saying, why don't you have email analytics? right? Like open rates and click rates and all that stuff. Um, why don't you have a CRM? I don't want to pay for my own CRM. Well, I understand you don't want to pay for your own CRM, but if I were to build my own CRM, I would have to invest millions of dollars where you can actually pay another CRM a hundred bucks and have the best CRM that you can, you can have. So we purposely do not build those features to force people to go and find the best solution for accomplishing, you know, that task, right? Keeping the contact, doing the follow-ups, like, of course, like I can build an open rates, right? Things like that. It's, it's not that hard, but now I'm supporting a feature that is not core to the video consumption experience. Oh, okay. Everything we do is to enhance the video consumption experience, make sure that people show up. Like the only reason we have emails is to make sure people show up. I want people to know if they use the webinar, people really show up. But anything beyond that has to go to, you know, a convert kit or a sales force or, you know, an active campaign, right? So that's kind of how we determine is like, what is the core thing? What is like, what is the thing that we want people to experience and achieve? In our case, it's an awesome video consumption experience. And then what are all those things that are kind of outside of that, that we say no to? Got it. That's incredible advice, honestly. Thank you for sharing all that. And I'm just curious, you know, at what point, I mean, how do you evaluate? Because you've been in, you know, you bootstrapped three companies at this point. How do you evaluate when sticking to some defined core objective is not optimal versus like a pivot that might be presenting itself? I'm just curious if that's come up for you in, in any of your journeys so far. Yeah, so um, I think there is one great indication of whether you're on the right path, right? And that's revenue. Like, are people buying right. this and sticking around? Mm -hmm. And if they are, you don't need to pivot, right? In in fact, like I think what makes more sense down the road, once you know you your team is paid for you know, your, your product is, is known has, you know, and has a good name in the market. People are signing up on their own. You might want to expand your product line with upsells, right? But the only reason you have to pivot is if people aren't signing up or if every sales pitch is too hard, or if they sign up and they don't convert or they convert and they don't stay, right? I've definitely had, you know, experiences like that in my previous company. We were always an open house solution. But 
we tried probably like seven or eight different versions of that before somebody actually paid money for it. Like we we always served a certain purpose, but we just had like too many moving parts. And then it had like a consumer product, like it had like a consumer facing front and a business facing front. And then it had a piece of hardware. Like there was just like too many things. Wow. So it wasn't like a hard, like 180 degree pivot, but we definitely had to change the product quite a bit in order for people to start paying for it. So I'd say if you have people paying, keep going. If yeah. you don't, and you have three months runway, for example, it's probably time to do something significantly different. Got it. Makes a lot of sense. It's a very simple, clear metric to follow there. So what, um, I'm just curious too, in terms of just tactically speaking. So what do you do to address churn and just getting users to actually fall in love with your product? Given that you, you know, the webinars are often people are using that for that specific purpose for, for other, other services and products. What do you see work really well for getting your new users to fully fall in love with e-webinar and not churn? Yeah, I mean, I think especially if you're serving SMBs, like some amount of churn is expected, right? Because sometimes people aren't churning from your product, right? They're churning from their job, right? Some people will say, you know, we have an exit survey that when people cancel, we ask them like why they're canceling. Are you not ready? Did you find something better? Um, are we missing a feature? Um, you know, and then we have like a comment box, for example. So we look at that quite a bit. Um, and then we look at all the people that churned or did not convert. Is there anything, you know, similar between these people? But I think number one is you have to have a product that is really good, right? And, and that's, it's so hard to communicate that, like in a way that, like, of course, that's common sense. Of course, you have a product that's good. It's very easy to build a product that accomplishes something, right? But it is extremely difficult to build a product with every single feature and detail like that is well thought out, that works, that is relatively bug-free free, and is beautiful. Um, and it's just built with love, right? It's easy to build a product but hard to build one with love. And I think that's the difference between like an apple of, of anything that they build and something else, right? It's not just about listening to music. Like if we're talking about headphones, right? It's also, you know, the quality of the microphone, the quality of the headphone, how well it fits, the packaging, you know, the branding, it's, it's all of that, right? So I think 90% of your marketing is amazing product. Right. So you have to focus on, especially nowadays, it's so easy to get a product out there, but so hard to build an incredible thing. So that's that's really step one is make a product so good that even if you don't have a lot of support, right? Even if you don't have phone support, most companies don't have phone support. We don't, we don't either. Even if there's a the steep learning curve. And I would say that our product has a learning curve. Like you still have to create a video and upload it and, and put in all the bells and whistles. It, it's not like, oh, I connected, it's done, right? Make a product so good that even though you don't have a lot of support, even though you're bootstrapped, even if there's a steep learning curve, that people want to stick with it because it's beautiful, it creates value, um, and it's, you know, and it's a delight to use, right? You don't want people to come in and the design is bad, it's clunky, they run into bugs right away. Um, you contact support, you know, they don't hear from you for two, three days. Like these are all things that I think if you're bootstrapping, you care a lot about because all of these things that I talked about is tied to revenue, <laughs> right? So it's not one thing, right? It's it's making sure that you have a great product that people just love. It delivers value. It's delightful. It's beautiful. But the other thing is make sure you get back to people within a reasonable time frame. Because your support okay. is also part of your brand. Got it. Uh, it's, yeah, that's an amazing connection. Um, so what, okay, if we, everything you just said, I mean, it sounds amazing. I'm just thinking about, there's that, there's that Reed Hoffman, you know, uh, LinkedIn founder quote where he says, if you didn't launch, you're not embarrassed with your version 1.0, <laughs> you launched too late. So how do you balance that in terms of like perfectionism versus you know, I guess just the that cadence of getting it out there, getting feedback and building it with love 
I guess, with that sort of real-time feedback and dollars in type of feedback as well. Yeah, that is one statement I don't agree with. And I think, um, you know, we used to talk about MVPs, right? Like 10 years ago or even more than that, like the lean startup movement and all that stuff. Um, And like, like you know, a product on a napkin. That does not work anymore. Like, I really don't know anyone who has launched an MVP that is that bare bone and actually converted it to a real product. And I don't mean beta customers, right? I mean, real paying customers. I think when Reed made that comment, we were like, we were as a society in a different place, right? Maybe the iPhone had just come out, right? We didn't have a lot of apps to, to, to choose from. We didn't have a lot of software to choose from. We didn't expect things to work immediately, right? We don't have fast internet speed. Not everyone had Wi-Fi, right? We go everywhere now, you're connected, right? Every app you open, you give it like five seconds before you're like, oh, this is crap. I got to get rid of it. Exactly. Right? Like we're just, in a, we're just in a different place, right? So I think back then, what he said is probably true, but our expectations as a consumer was also much lower. And this is actually exactly why I started eWebinar two months after I sold Spacio, because I didn't want to wait for consumer expectations to go up yet another level before I put something out there. Because I know whatever I put myself in, it's going to be you know two to five years just to start seeing result. Mm-hmm. So I think now I would define MVP as the minimal viable product somebody would pay for. And if you put something out there and you're embarrassed about it, just know that people are not going to give you the time of their day and they are definitely not going to give you their credit card. But it depends, right? If if all you want right now is feedback from your friends or feedback from some beta users, like, yeah, okay, then that's, you know, that's probably a good place to, to put something out there that you're slightly embarrassed about. But if you expect people to put their credit card out there, you better make sure that it works And if there are bugs, you better make sure you can work on them fairly quickly because nobody is going to incorporate a buggy product into their workflow. And nobody is ever going to put a customer-facing piece of software in front of their customers if it doesn't make them look good. So I just think, like, as a society, we're we're just in a different place right now. Got it. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I've never really thought of that additional layer of context around when he said that versus where we are now. That's, that's really a really interesting take. So what, um, I mean, given that you mentioned design a few times, you brought up Apple, obviously amazing design. How do you approach being bootstrapped and making beautiful product? How do you, like, yeah, how does, because that's like, that's such a, a nebulous and often, you know, hard to pin down uh task of making something something beautiful on a budget. How do you approach that? That is one place that we spend a lot of money. So um we are bootstrap, but we still, you know, my I had an exit before this, so I have, you know, some flexibility. My co-founder and I both invested capital to get the company started. We also have some friends and family funding um, in the beginning. And design is something that I have never skimped on. Like not on any of my companies. And, you know, we only work with designers that are through referrals or or people that we've worked with in the past. And I tell them the exact same story is, you would rather have a product that kind of works, that is absolutely stunning, that people are curious about, than to have something that works really well, but is ugly. A perfect example of that is a new restaurant opens in your neighborhood. It's absolutely stunning but their food kind of sucks, right? And you go there, you're like, hey, I really feel good being in this restaurant, really like their bar, but the food's not very good. Oh, they're new, but you know, maybe, you know, may- maybe I'll come back another time, right? If you have a restaurant that is absolutely run down and the food's good, but you're uncomfortable sitting there, you're not going to take your friends there, right? So that's the approach that we've always taken is delight people, make them feel like, a lot of effort has been put in, make them feel like they love coming into the shop, coming into the restaurant, and they're going to be more patient, you know, to figure things out. And of course, like you, of course you have to, you have to have a product that works, 
right? But in the beginning, you would rather build less features than to have a product that doesn't wow people visually. And we we take the exact same approach with our website as well, right? We want it to copy, not copy, but mimic the, you know, how a mail chip makes you feel, right? Energetic colors, you want to feel alive, you want to feel like this is startup y, but established, right? You want people to feel come to your website and feel like you can serve small companies, but big companies won't be embarrassed to use you. Right. So it it's really down to the branding, the name, the font, um, you know, the font choices, um, assets, you know, things like that. But I would say as a bootstrap company, we chose to build way less features and spend way more time and money on design. In fact, I think we probably spent five or six months just on the design and the branding and like including the product design before any code uh, was actually was actually put in. Wow. And was, was MailChimp a deliberate choice because if maybe I'm, I, I remember if I recall correctly, they're also they bootstrap very successfully. No, I, I mean, it was, they just, they just have a brand that's just fun. Right. Okay. I mean, actually, anyone that goes to a website now, you'll realize like, I mean, they were they were acquired, I think, a couple of years ago, but like their design has completely shifted from what it was before. It's definitely not as fun. It's more big company now. Yeah. Oh, but, you know, it's got like fun colors that pop. Right. They don't use like the, you know, the typical blue and gray. Right. They're using pink and yellow and green. And there's a, you know, there's a monkey on it. And there's, you know, kind of like not like not your typical font choices. So it's just something that always stuck in my mind. Yeah. Um, but they're also a company that serves companies of all sizes, right? So I think when we were thinking about like who we want to grow up to become, um, that was just like the one brand that that always came back. That's awesome. And then, you know, you mentioned too, how as a bootstrap company, you're not dumping a bunch of money into advertising, right? But you're investing, you're investing, like you said, so much in design and having the, these very core features that work extremely well. To what extent does that play into your acquisition, like acquisition strategies for getting new users? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so that's like the constant like bane of my existence. <laughs> right? Like, how do we get more people to find us? Um, we don't have any marketing budget. Like our marketing budget is zero. Um, we've tried ads here and there, but the most we're able to put in is like one or 2,000. So it, it's not meaningful. Um, and because we weren't able to test it on a long-term basis, it's just something that we just stopped doing. Um, but you know, it forces us because we're bootstrapped and have zero marketing dollars, um, because we have to, we're not profitable, right? So we have to pay salaries and I don't pay myself. And every, every month there's a new person or a new campaign or, or something or a new partnership that I want to invest in. Um, and, and so we really have to be forced to think about how do we get creative with marketing? So you you had mentioned you saw me post, uh, you know, on LinkedIn. That's a you know community audience building strategy. I post once a day on you know my my journey bootstrapping three companies. Uh, we create a lot of content for not just our our website but also in in product. So um, I beg our customers to write Captera reviews, make testimonial videos. Like I'm always trying to create more content that's searchable online. Um, and then there are certain things where, you know, within the product itself, um, we try to put, you know, our logo or let people know, hey, this is a, a webinar powered by eWebinar. Um, but when you have no money, I think you just kind of have to be forced to figure out like what are the different ways that, you know, people can find you. And podcasting was one of the channels that I wanted to test last year. So um, last year I was on over 60 podcasts. Wow. And yeah, over time they're kind of like trickling out. But Everything we do is evergreen, right? We we no longer do like one shot events, sponsorships. Like these are all things that I tried last year that I just felt like was, was just a waste of money, right? But we we try to try everything at least once uh, before we write it off. But right now, I think audience building, community building, and just creating evergreen content that's useful, even if it's not about your product. Like when I post, I'm posting something about bootstrapping a company and my experience and the things I've learned, my failures. I don't really talk about my product. That's only if, you know, people come to my profile, then they'll know what I'm doing today. But it's just a different world right now that I'm still trying to navigate. 
Got it. But I mean, what among all that has been the most promising so far, would you say? What have you seen just even anecdotally would really provide you a lift in terms of users? You know, I wish I knew because um, all the things that I'm talking about, the attribution, the attribution is extremely difficult. Um, like, I don't know when people sign up if they heard from me from this podcast or another one I did last year or if they saw a webinar. Because we do have, like, within our demo, the first question we ask is, how did you hear about us? Like, 60% of people will answer, but sometimes it's like, friend, boss, forgot. Right. So people don't really tell you. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say that the two most, I believe, effective channels um, are, you know, anything within the product that we can build in. So another word for that is product led growth, right? Because there's a natural virility that's built in. Like if somebody watches this webinar, then right. they're like, oh, this looks different than a Zoom. What is it? It's more colorful or it's got all these engagements. Then they'll look it up and then they'll sign up. And that's the other reason why you want to make sure that your product is incredible. Because right. if someone else has a good experience with it, they're going to tell their friends and, you know, maybe they'll write a review or, you know, maybe they'll like send me a, you know, send me a personal note that I can then use on our website. Uh, but the second channel that I think works best is is probably just LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. it, it feels like it's like the gift that keeps on giving. It nice. does take a lot of energy if you want to do it properly to, you know, create that content. But I do think it's worth it because you're also building your own tribe um, of people that that want to support you. Um, and then once they know your name, your company's name, then they're going to refer it um, to their friends as well. That's awesome. Well, Melissa, uh, where can people go go for, uh, find out more about eWebinar themselves, try it out, and uh, experience the magic? <laughs> yeah, well, the best place is definitely eWebinar.com. It's spelled exactly as it sounds, eWebinar.com. We've got a demo um, that you can join anytime, of course, deliver it through our own product in a very meta way. Nice. Uh, and if you, have, if you have any questions about myself, my journey, or the products, um, just connect with me on LinkedIn. My name is spelled Melissa Kwan, K-W-A-N. Awesome, Melissa. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your insights with us and uh, really enjoyed our conversation. And have a great rest of your day or evening out there in Amsterdam. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ian. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of VidTal Podcast. Again, my name is Ian Naj, co-founder of VidTal, and really appreciate you having a listen. And it means a lot. So if you have any feedback, go ahead and email us at info at vidtal.com. Love to hear your ideas for future shows, future guests. If you want to be a guest, let us know. Love to chat. Also, just as a reminder, this show has been sponsored by VidTal, which is our free YouTube ad library, vidtal.com. Again, you can go to VidTal and look up over a million ads at this point inside of VidTal. They're all unlisted YouTube ads. You can see what your competitors are running, track the results on a day-by-day -day basis, find new ads inside of our YouTube ad library, VidTal. And we also have a premium edition of VidTal. So the library is free to access. But for full unlimited access to the library, we have a premium edition of VidTal. We also have training from our Inseply.com agency, which is our sister company to VidTal, where we've managed over $150 million on YouTube. We provide training on media buying, creatives, tracking, copywriting, everything in between. It's all there inside of VidTal Premium. And right now we're running a very special deal on VidTal Premium. And you can go claim that right now at vidtow.com. When you sign up for free, you'll see the offer to join premium and go there and check that out. And last thing, we also do uh, free brainstorm calls with our agency, Inseply. Go to inseply.com slash call. And we love brainstorming with you on your video advertising and just marketing in general. Love to chat. So inseply.com slash call, C-A-L-L. Would love to speak with you. So thanks again for joining us and looking forward to the next show. In the meantime, have a great week.